That was very nice. I'll try not to screw it up. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I'm an alcoholic, and my name is Beth Gordon. Hi, and I've got to say, this is a privilege and a not... What? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't like these things. It, it, is, it, actually, it is a privilege and an honor to be here. To, um, it always, it, and I think Joe said this uh, last night, that it is a privilege and an honor to do anything that you're asked to do in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, good grief, I, I, uh, I owe you my life. And, um, you know, and I, I look at the lives of, of my children and, and my grandchildren, and, yeah, now here come the greats. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, see, I see so much of Alcoholics Anonymous in their lives. Are they alcoholics? No, I just have one grandson that is in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. But um, everybody, it is just an amazing thing to see, and it's very, very difficult for me to explain it. But I thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. I think this is a wonderful conference. You really have kicked it off well, and you are... You know, it's it's going to be amazing what's going to happen here over the years. I mean, to have this many people at your first one is amazing within itself. And that, too, is, is a great honor and a privilege to be able to share in, in the first. And Joe was saying that, too, last night. And another honor and privilege for me is I'm, you know, I'm speaking with people that I know um, and that especially two of them have become very dear, close friends of mine. I mean, my favorite Al-Anon is going to be speaking, and I don't say that to hurt anybody's feelings. That's just how she is. And um, it, it's just the whole weekend. I, I thank you so much for including me in this, and I can't say enough about Barbara. I got cards from her over the year, I got phone calls, I got this, I got that, and I felt like I knew her. Uh, and that was important to me, Barb, and it, it really was. You are quite a gal, quite a gal, and I thank God for you, too. New friend, love it, love it. So, now, down to the brass axe. Uh, there's a couple of things I need to tell you. I need to tell you that I have a sobriety day, and it is by the grace of God. And people in rooms like this and, and 12 steps and good sponsorship that I have not found it necessary to pick up a drink or take anything else since March the 5th of 1972, and for this I am extraordinarily thankful that. And... Welcome yourself. You worried about it? And uh, <laughs> they just don't want to reprint all this goop. Uh, if it spills on it. It's, and when you applaud, you know you're applauding for yourselves because if it hadn't been for people like you, uh, I don't know what would have happened to me. Um, and I'm grateful, very, very grateful. And I also have a homebrew and this golden link, and we meet in Macedonia, Ohio, on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And if you're ever in Macedonia, Ohio, which is nine miles north of Akron, come visit us. Um, I think it's the best home group in the world. And my home group has taught me an awful lot. My home group has taught me responsibility, to be where I say I'm going to be and do what I say I'm going to do unless it's humanly impossible. My home group told me to be ever aware and watchful of the new person that walks into the room and to go up and, and say to them, welcome. And, you know, take their cold hand in your warm one and to look at him and, and to say those two words that people said to me that, that uh, were so meaningful in the beginning of my sobriety, I understand. And... Um, 
They, my home group has taught me how to get to meetings early and hang around late and, and to join in the fellowship of what goes on and to tidy up. I remember a long, a long time ago when I first got sober, um, we didn't have styrofoam cups. We had china cups, and we'd spend hours in the kitchen after a meeting and in the fellowship, just cleaning those up. And we, we all smoked. Everybody smoked. In fact, the room was so full of smoke, you couldn't see who was there, which on occasion was kind of a good thing. And um, we used to spend hours doing the ashtrays and things like that. And I, I just love my home group. And to stay actively involved in, in my home group is very, very important to me. Yes, I miss it on Sundays when I am out of town. And I think that's why I have been doing uh, literature for the last 30 years for my home group. They call it my pens. So uh, I love them, love them dearly, and do come visit us. Um, and I also have a sponsor. And uh, my sponsor has 47 years of uninterrupted sobriety. And I love her dearly. She's tough stuff. And she isn't the first sponsor I had. The first sponsor I had, um, and God bless her, and I pray for her all the time. The uh, first sponsor I had um, picked up a drink when I had uh, four years of sobriety and uh, took her own life when I had six years of sobriety. And the message she left me with was this. It is imperative to practice the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous in all your affairs. Because if you don't, you're going to go down. And um, I thank God for her, though, that she was there in the beginning and, and uh, guided me to, to build the program of recovery on concrete and not on shifting sand. Uh, I immediately got another sponsor and had Miriam until she passed away with umpty years of sobriety. And then I immediately got another sponsor. You told me I shouldn't be without one. And I can see why today. And because, you know, people say, why do you need a sponsor? You have 37 years of sobriety. I'll tell you, that's when you need one more than you've ever needed one in your life. And because I have a thinking problem. I don't know about you, but I've got this committee that resides in my head. And every year I'm sober, I get one more committee member up there. It's <laughs> getting a load. And uh, they'll say things to me like, oh, you don't need to go to another meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, oh, you're just fine. Why do you have to work on the 10th step? You know, you're perfect. Nothing is the matter with you. You know, and it'll go on and on and on, and if I let it take hold, I'm going to be in trouble. But with a sponsor, I can get to a phone. With a sponsor, she can point out my defects of character so that I'm continually working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I continue to work the steps with her. Um, and the next sponsors that I had moved to Tucson, Arizona, and they love it out there. And they call up when the snow is falling and, and it's 20 below in Cleveland, and they'll say, uh-huh, uh-huh, why don't you come live out here? I know. So, and then when they moved, I immediately got another one, and I see her at least four times a week at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and keep in constant contact with her. And this is what I have to do, you know, on this journey. And we were, he was... Joe was talking about the journey last night, how we slump along on the road of happy destiny. I love that. I got laughing about that last night. Our trudging on the road of happy destiny, and um, it's really been a journey. And you told me, you know, that it was going to be a journey. You, you said to me that, yeah, this whole thing is like a journey, like maybe getting on the choo-choo train and you look out the window, and sometimes you see really nice stuff out there that makes you feel all good on the inside. You know, the flowers are blowing, and the sky is blue, and the clouds are, are white, and um, stuff just makes you feel good on the inside. But if you stay on the journey long enough, you get to the point where you're going to go through some dark areas, and it's not going to make you feel real good. 
you know, and, and the thing that I was told was, and this is what we're all about, if you stay in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, what we'll teach you is how to get through stuff so you see a ray of sunshine coming through any dark cloud. And we will teach you that there is no reason in the world to pick up a knife if you're working the program of recovery on a daily basis and you have us to help you with it. You know, I, I just love that. And I remember that to this day. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I used to think I can't wait till I get it made, till I know everything. You know, till I know all about the 12 steps, till, till I know all there is about Alcoholics Anonymous. And my sponsor just laughed at me, and she said, you know, you'll never know it all. You never get there. And I said, the day I die, I'll get there. And she said, let me tell you something about the day you die, Toots. The day you die, you go to the big meeting in the sky, and when you walk through the doors, you're going in as a new person, and you're starting all over again. So forget that one. So I can't put anything over on her. But anyway, it's uh, been quite a journey, and it says to tell in a general way, you know, what it was like and what happened. I loved that last night, Joe, about your what happened. And... and uh, what's going on today. I didn't pick up a drink till I was 26 years old. I didn't want to be like her. And her was my mother. Uh, my mother was a full-blown alcoholic. Uh, she was a quiet alcoholic. She went to bed a lot. And, but I was left with the responsibility of my stepbrother. And I didn't like it because I had to take him everywhere. I had to take care of him. And, and I just, I hated it. And, um, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, what you told to me was this. You know, resentment rots the pot it's in, so you better do something about it. And what we want you to do is think about all the positive stuff that maybe your mother did for you. So I went home, and I, you know, along the line, I'm starting to think, and I remembered that, um, you know, when my mother was three months pregnant with me, my first father was murdered in a speakeasy at the age of 24 on Thanksgiving Day of 1930. And um, he had gone, I was born and raised in, in a suburb of Chicago. And um, basically there was no alcohol allowed in Chicago except to a guy by the name of Mr. Capone. And um, he knew where everything was and people who had the alcohol irregardless of what he said. And uh, my father at 24 needed to have a drink. I found out he was a full-blown alcoholic um, and um, he was shot to death on a barroom floor um, on the Thanksgiving day. And my mother was pregnant with me. She was what you call a bleeder. She was in the hospital. And... Um, so mom was left a widow at a very early age, and she and I went to live with my grandfather, who was from Scotland. My mother was from Scotland, and uh, we resided with uh, him until Grandpa died, and then we moved into a little home. And um, I remember that the feelings that I had had that... Uh, I didn't have a dad, and that made it real tough for me in kindergarten. And also, I talked funny. I grew up listening to a Scottish brook. That's all I heard. And, and so the kids couldn't understand me, and they laughed at me. And I used to go home from school, and I didn't want to go anymore, and I cried and everything. But Mom was always there like a rock. And she took me to get diction lessons um, so that I wouldn't talk funny anymore. And I, I remember that then she married, uh, when I was eight years old, one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. I've never thought of him as my stepfather. And that when my brother was born, I was happy as I could be. And Mama tried to make me feel like it was my baby, so I didn't feel left out. And I remembered all that stuff. And all that stuff 
was very, very important to me. And I was able to go and make amends to my mama before she passed away and to tell her honestly that I had loved her and to thank her for what she had done for me. Um, that was very, very important to me. But I didn't want to be like, you know, I didn't want to be like her, and here I was stuck with this younger brother, and uh, it was real tough. Every time I went out on a date, I had to take him along, and it, it, was, it was tough stuff. So um, I, I build up this resentment, and I build up an attitude back there that stayed with me all the time. I didn't like anybody. I didn't trust anybody. I was selfish. I was self-centered. I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And all this went on before I picked up a drink. And when Prince Charming came driving along in his 1955 Ford, I hopped in it and we went off into the sunshine. And I knew I was going to have everything I wanted, finally, because I was getting married, and that's the way it was, I thought. Which was not right, because marriage is a givey, givey, givey thing, and I didn't know how to give, I didn't want to give, I wanted to take, I was selfish, I was self-centered, and here I was married to a wonderful, wonderful human being, and I started building up another resentment against him. And when my first daughter was born, a year after we were married, I didn't like being a mother either. Because I had to do what I had to do when I had to do it. And I didn't want it that way. And what's so funny about that is when I was a little girl running in the sunshine chasing butterflies, all I ever wanted to be was a good wife and a good mother. And now I had it, and now I didn't want it anymore. And uh, so we were at a party. And somebody said to me, you know, you're always so uptight. You're always so tense. You you're always look so cross. You never smile. He said, here, why don't you have a drink? And I picked that sucker up. It was a Manhattan on the rocks with a bunch of garbage, and I threw it down. And I don't need to tell you what happened to me. You know, I, I, uh, I started to smile. I came in from out there. I could talk to you about anything, from how you raise your children to fixing a toilet, to, to doing out of sewer, to taking a sink apart, to doing this, to doing that. I knew everything, and, and I had found the magic I had been looking for. And I think what put the frosting on the cake was when I went to the bathroom and I washed my hands and I looked in the mirror and I saw Elizabeth Taylor as she once looked, <laughs> excuse me, looking back at me and I thought I got it made. This is the deal. But I mean, reality shot out the window right away. And from that point on, I drank, I got drunk, and I got into a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Not right away because it doesn't work that way. Alcohol is cunning, it's baffling, and it's powerful. And it waits. It just waits. And it started, I loved scotch, loved it. And used to go, we had back then, in the olden days, as my grandchildren, I have one of my grandsons, I have 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren, and one of her, my daughter-in-law called me up, and she said, Mom, <coughs> Joshua, who is seven, went to school. And um, the teacher was talking to him about Indians. And um, she said, you'll love this one. She said, uh, did you ever see an Indian? And Joshua raised his hand. He said, no, but my grandma, I bet, did. And he says she and he said, I'm gonna go home and ask grandma. I bet grandma knew sitting bowl. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> Pretty close, but not quite. And uh I I lo I love my grandchildren. Love them. But anyway, so we had state liquor stores. And um 
you had to fill out a little sheet of paper when you went in there. You had to put down your name, and you had to put down what you wanted and hand it to the guy behind the counter. And he'd go running around, and he'd get the bottle down, and, and then he'd holler out, black and white scotch, Elizabeth Gordon, and you go, and go and get it. Well, I got thinking. And you know, with this committee in my head, uh, that's not too swift. So I got thinking, you know, I'm going to a lot of state liquor stores, and I bet they're on to me. And, and I bet they're sending all these little fill-outs that I'm doing down to Washington because there's so many of them. And I'll bet you then they're going to turn them over to the FBI because they probably think something's going on with her. And they're going to come looking for me. I mean, this is how my thinking was. When I got sober, my sponsors said, don't think. That's the worst thing you can do. And I, and I, thought, I cut myself shaving. A couple of I was shaving my legs, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, you slap toilet paper on it. And then I went to bed, and, uh, and I thought, my goodness, it's getting soggy. Maybe it's bleeding. Maybe I cut myself worse than I thought. Maybe I ought to get up and put Neurosporin on it. Maybe I have to go get stitches. I'll tell you, within 10 minutes, I, I had my leg amputated. That's how this goes. And back then, it was worse. So I switched. I switched to wine. And I loved wine. It was like rocket juice. You, you could get it anywhere you wanted, you know, and, and I loved it. I loved all that stuff, the good stuff, you know, Muscatel and Italian Swiss Colony Sherry. And the guy on the next street made Mad Dog, and I loved that because it had crunchy stuff on the bottom. You know, I felt like I was getting my vitamins. And, um, you know, it came in all different sizes, and you, you could sneak in the little stuff, and you could get the large economy size and, and pour it into different things. My favorite place to hide my alcohol was a douche bag. And... Um, <laughs> If you don't know what one is, go home and ask your grandmother. She'll tell you. <laughs> but I could pour it in there and um, put foil over the top and then hang it up in the bathroom. And then, you know, when the great thirst would come over me, I'd walk in the door and shut it. And then, you know, you take the hose and then click it. And go, 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 go. Down it would go. And that worked to swell for a while. No trouble with a second steady. Um, that worked for a while. And then he found that out. So then, you know, you have to look for other things, like you throw it in the dryer, and then the day comes when the, somebody else starts a dryer and everybody goes around smelling like Italians with colony for months. And, you know, I'd paint them white and hang them out the window and not think anybody saw them because the house is white and, you know, all that delusionary stuff. And, uh, you know, it worked for a while. Then I got into um, the checking account and the savings account, and um, I was ruining and destroying that. And after five years, my husband came to me, and he said, Listen, it can't go on like this. You obviously have a problem. I want you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, or I'm going to cut off your allowance. Those were the magic words, because without that allowance coming in, I couldn't have done anything. I was taken off the checking account. I was already off the savings account, you know, and I used to whine about that when I first got sober. And you know what you said to me? you got to earn the right you got to earn the right to do the things that normal people do. And when I was sober five years, my husband put me back on the checking account and the savings account not one day before. I had to earn the right. I had to show responsibility. And, um, but back then, no, and I knew if I didn't have allowance coming in, I was going to be in a heap of trouble. So I said I'd go, and I went around to Alcoholics Anonymous for the first of three times. And if you're new, please listen. I went into meetings late. 
just after they started, and I sat way in the back of the room. And I, oh, well, I heard what you said. I heard about your job losses, your family losses. I heard about your divorces. I heard about your DWIs or your DUIs, all that kind of stuff. But see, that hadn't happened to me yet. And I think yet is a terribly important word in these rooms. Because if you go out and do what you did, you're going to get what you got in spades. I have never seen it fail in 37 years. Never seen it fail. This is a gift. And I'm sure the givey of the gift gets a little tired after a while. Um, it's something I don't want to play with. But anyway, you know, and then as you rose to say the Lord's Prayer, I'd leave. One woman got my phone number, and she was sorry she did. And, uh, you know, and I, I just lasted maybe a couple of meetings. And then a couple of years later, the social service workers came into the house. Um, my children were going to school, not uh, dressed properly. Uh, the neighbors had noticed that it seemed like my, old, my oldest daughter was taking more and more charge of things. Um, a teacher at the school over here heard my oldest daughter say to my youngest daughter, if she gets sick, don't go home, because she's there. And uh, they had reported me. I, I didn't want to lose my children. I didn't. Now, my husband was a sales engineer, and he traveled. He had a lot of the territory in Ohio. Um, I asked him when I got sober, I said, how did you feel, Bruce? I mean, you go on your, your, you know, on your business trips, and, and we'd be at home. He said to me, and Bruce stood over six feet tall, and he had shoulders like the Rocky Mountains, and he was a man's man. Good bowler, good golfer, good, good all-around guy. And I remember him looking at me and saying, I never knew what fear was until alcoholism hit our home and turned it into a house. He said, I never had been afraid in my life. And he said, Beth, I used to sit out there in that driveway, and I knew that I had to go to work, that I had the responsibility of getting food on the table, that I had the responsibility of watching out for my children, of paying a mortgage, of doing all that. And he said, and down in the pit of my stomach was this horrible feeling of terror. He said, I can't explain it to you. It was absolutely horrific. And I used to sit out there, and I used to pray, what should I do? What should I do? And he said, I, I always did what I had to do. I always backed that car out, and I went to work. And he said, I want to tell you, I'd call the kids to check up on them. And he said, I knew by the way they were talking, that you were standing right there. And he said, I never felt so powerless in my life. There wasn't a thing in the world I could do, and I didn't understand. He said, I had no one to talk to, no one to share this with. And uh, God bless him. You know, just God bless him. Um, I went around to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want to lose my kids. I went to one meeting a week. Uh, I'll tell you, today, I, can't, I cannot go to one meeting a week. I don't know what you do. I don't know what you can do. And I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm only saying what I've got to do. And I have got to go to a minimum of three meetings a week. I have to, to keep the committee in line. And anyway, I love to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I usually end up going to four or five. Really love it. Really love it. But that then, back then, I didn't. And, and uh, fiddled around again. And uh, four years after that, uh, a judge looked at me over a thing like this. And he said, 90 days in the workhouse 
or you're going to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want to go to the workhouse. They had striped suits back then, and I didn't like the way I looked in stripes. So I said, I'll go to AA. I was up on a terrible, I was on my ninth DUI. I was up on an assault and battery charge. I had had an altercation with a Summit County Sheriff, and he had wanted to take me home, and I didn't want him to. I thought, what will the neighbors think? Um, so I got mad at him, and I picked up a wine bottle out of the car and bopped him over the head with it. And he got 24 stitches, and I had my numbers take, my, my picture taken with some numbers under my chin. Um, and I was in trouble. So I said, I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous, Your Honor. So I didn't play the same game, and I'll tell you, the next four years were hell. You know, this is absolutely a family disease. I had, you know, my children didn't know whether to say hello to me. They didn't know whether to say goodbye to me. My husband said, you know, they said, we'd like Mama to see our schoolwork. They couldn't show Mama her their schoolwork. They were terrified Mama would tear up their schoolwork or chastise them. And I had smart kids that were trying to make do in school in spite of what was going on at home. And, and I want to tell you the fear that those kids left with every morning. A daughter that got up and tried to make these kids their breakfast, tried to pack lunches because I was too busy drinking. Uh, it was a nightmare for them. And, you know, one day I was looking out the second-story window and at the bus stop, and I saw, you know, here were the neighbor ladies, and their hair was shiny, and they were laughing, and they were holding on to the hands of their children. And my children were standing over there. Nobody wants their kids to play with the children of an alcoholic. Because if you invite them anywhere, she might come. And she had come. She had gone into parties they were invited to. She, she had gone into Chuck E. Cheese when they were invited to be there. She had gone into school and pulled fits. She had to just destroy the lives of four little people. They didn't have any friends left because people are terrified to let their kids close to the children of an alcoholic. So they were lonely, they lived in fear, and they were terribly upset. And my husband, anymore, he, he didn't have any friends left. They didn't tell him about the bullying league anymore. They didn't tell him about the golfing league. They didn't ask him to go places because they were afraid that she would show up, and she had. She'd gone out on golf courses. She'd gone into his business. She had destroyed everything that this man was trying to build until he didn't have any friends left either. And it is the loneliest existence ever, not only for the alcoholic, who I didn't have any friends left. You know, sometimes I'd go outside and wave at somebody in the neighborhood. Nobody waved back. And it wasn't only me, it was the whole family that suffered from this. And I didn't understand why. And there were days when I would have given anything, anything, to have it changed. And the pain hurt so badly when I'd see the loneliness and frustration in those faces that all I knew how to handle the pain was to drink more. And on March the 4th of 1972, sitting at a kitchen table, I watched my family go to church. I'd finished everything there was to drink in the house by 9 o'clock that morning. And it was the first time I didn't have that god-awful feeling down here that if I don't have a drink, I don't know what's going to happen to me. 
And I sat there and I watched my children and my husband go to work. Nobody said goodbye. <laughs> On those faces, I saw the hell and damnation and horror that this disease puts on people that once loved you and you loved them. And when that door shut, I knew something. That all those looks, that I, all those things I had seen was because I am an alcoholic and I wanted help. I wanted to live. You know, I knew I was dying, and it wasn't that I weighed like 62 pounds and my hair was coming out of sheets and all that kind of stuff. I knew I was dying, and I wanted to do something about it. I feel today, and have felt for a long, long time, that in a split second of time, that little part of me I call my soul, that hadn't been chewed alive by alcohol, opened up, and God zoomed in with a gift of sobriety. I didn't say God help me. I'd slammed the door on him a long time ago. But I do believe the gift was given. And I don't think it's going to be given again. And maybe that's why I stay in meeting rooms. Maybe that's why I keep doing the same thing I've been doing for 37 years. I don't want to take the chance. I heard somebody say in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous once, you know, we sit in these meeting rooms or we're with each other and, and we, we feel safe and we feel wonderful. And we laugh a lot, we cry, we blah, blah, blah. And all the time we're doing this, alcohol is out in the parking lot doing push-ups, just waiting. No, thank you. I went to the phone, and I called my Aunt Jean in Chicago, who had nine years of uninterrupted sobriety at that time. And I asked her the name. You know, I asked her, I had told her that I wanted help, uh, that I am an alcoholic. And she asked me the name of an old-timer who had never given up hope on me. And his name is Jerry Jackson, and Jerry died with many years of sobriety. Um... I had met Jerry uh, early on in the 60s when I was attending meetings uh, off in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Jerry had come over and met my family, and Jerry had given them hope, the same kind of hope we give to each other, you know, um, and a meeting, the same kind of hope we give to each other when we're having coffee with each other. That same kind of hope that... You know, we, we give to the new person when we take their cold hands and our warm one and we say welcome, that we understand. And, and the hope that rings eternal throughout meeting rooms, you know, it's, it's special. And that's what my family hung on to. You know, uh, I, my Aunt Jean left me with a message, and the message she left me with was this. When my Aunt Jean was sober 20 years, she decided she didn't need to go to AA meetings anymore. And um, six months later, she picked up a drink. And three months after that, she died of internal hemorrhaging. It's there. It's white. But right then, there she was. Um, and God bless her for being there. You know, Jerry said it isn't going to be easy, uh -uh. but nothing in life that's worthwhile is easy. But he said to me, I'll make you promise. If you take our hands and you come on this journey with us, it's going to get better. And you know what? I found out better is. Better is able to stand this. Better is able to be able to, you know, be with myself. I never could stand myself before. I don't know how long it took me to look into a mirror into my own eyes and say, have a good day, when I got sober. I couldn't stand it. Today I better stand it because everywhere I go, I'm already there. You know, I go to the bathroom, I'm sitting on it. So, you know, I get in the car, I move over. So, and if I'm uncomfortable with this, I got to work on this. 
and to thank God for the 10th step, you know, really and seriously. And then they came, the sponsors, the kamikazes. In the house they came. They didn't come announce, they just blew in. And they told you everything they never, you never wanted anybody to know. And all they were doing was sharing their experience, strength, and their hope, telling you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today for them. I miss 12-step calls. We're getting them back in, up there in the Akron, Cleveland area. And I, I remember the first 12-step call I went on. I had, was sober about four months, and for nine months I shook like I was standing on a foot machine. And uh, my sponsor calls one day, she says, the hand is out. And when the hand is out, we are responsible. Be there in 10 minutes. I didn't know what the hand was doing sticking out. I mean, I... So I get in the car and we drive along and she's telling me about a 12-step call. So we... God. We get there, we go to the door. Nobody answers. So I start back to the car. She said, where are you going? I, I said, nobody's home. She said, wait a minute. See up there on the second floor, the windows open this much. We're going to go into the garage and see if they have an extension ladder. I said, that's breaking and entering. She said, no, it isn't. She called us. We didn't call her. And when the hand is an item. So we went in, we found them, we put it up, and she said, you're going up. I said, I'm afraid of heights. Faith and fear do not dwell in the same house. And when the, I didn't want to hear about that idiot hand anymore. So I go up with much ado from below. And when I got to the top, I pushed the, the window open further. And as I'm going through, I caught my foot on the windowsill and fell in flat down on the poor suffering alcoholic that's laying spread eagle on the floor hanging on to her vodka bottle. I didn't know what to say to her. I'm this far away from her face. I never did. I went in laying on top of this woman. I just looked at her and said, did you call alcoholics enough? And I said, she, she, was, she stayed sober for 50 for 15 years till she died, she said every day was out of fear. <laughs> Whatever works, you know. <laughs> but it's in me. I think about some of the stuff, geez. I, it's in these rooms that, that um, I'm learning how to stay sober. You know, it's in these rooms I felt your ear handshake for the first time. I felt a hug for the first time. I, I looked in eyes that, that uh, were kind and caring about men business. I, uh, you know, I was given different assorted things to do to get, to get going, uh, you know, to get actively involved in the rooms of AA. I was given brooms to my, and mops to mop the floor and to sweep the floor, and you told me nobody, nobody could pick up a drink with two or with poop in their hand. Um, and you were there, and you were kind, and you were loving, but you meant business. And uh, I remember a lot of times I was talked to like the cops used to talk to me. You know, get in, get out, sit down, shut up, blah, 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 blah. But I needed that. I needed that. And then you got me going with the four absolutes. Up there we use these. Uh, nothing is absolute. No one is absolutely perfect. But my sponsor said to me, we're going to start there because she said you're too fuzzed up to read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, "There's, you know, these are honesty, unselfishness, love, and purity. And she said, these absolutes are woven like golden threads throughout the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she said, the most important thing about these is there's four questions that come out of these that I, I want you to try to remember 
before you make a decision or open the hole in your face. Is what you are about to do and say true or false? Is what you are about to do and say ugly or beautiful? Is what you are about to do and say right or wrong? How will it affect the other guy? Help you, I will. Hurt you, I will not. It's just that simple. And then you got me going on the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, reading two pages a day out loud to get it in here, too, here and down in here. And I still do that today. Read two pages a day out loud in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we have a 24-hour book up there, and I know it isn't conference approved, but we read it anyway. That's a hut for the day. And you said read it four times a day out loud to get the thought for the day in the here. And I did it because I wanted to be sober more than I wanted to be in front. And you got me going on a lot of things and started me working on the 12 steps this way in life for the first time in my life. And it's a continual thing with those 12 steps over and over and over and over and over again. And thank God I have sponsors who do that with me. And I love to sponsor. I mean, I, I think it's a privilege and an honor to sponsor somebody. It keeps me on my toes. I cannot tell somebody to go to a meeting if I'm not going. I can't tell somebody, oh, why don't you go work a step if I'm not going to help them out with it. If I'm not doing it, how can I ask them to do it? You know, I, I'm a, a great one for you. We hear a lot of things from up here, you know, no matter where we are. And my deal is show me. You know, show me what to do. Show me what you're doing. Uh, and thank God it's been like that. And I came to believe in you. And boy, did I, did I ever, you never lied to me. Yeah, I got all emotional when I'm talking about this and I don't want to weep. Uh, it, you know, it is just, you've always been there. Always been there to show me the way, never lied. Never, and, and then my sponsor said, you're ready at night. Get down to your knees, take your bedroom slippers off, get down to your knees, shove them under your bed, and say thank you. I said, to who and for what? They said, you'll find out who you're talking to. Don't push the river. It runs by itself. Easy does it, but do <laughs> You know, all that junk. And then they said, and then when you wake up in the morning and you listen, lie there and listen to the sounds of a new day, I thought you were nuts. You bloom where you're planted, you take time to smell up the flowers, and now you're saying, listen to the sounds of the beginning of the new day? And you said, did you ever hear them? I said, no. And they said, try it, you might like it. I heard wind for the first time in my life. I heard rain. I heard the way ice sounds after an ice storm when it crinkles on trees. I heard the coyotes howling in the valley, you know, and, and, and all those things, that, you know, the way the creaks and groans in, in the home and, and the people breathing that I lived with love in the home. Try it. You know, you might like it. The only thing I'll say to you, if you live by yourself and you're somebody breathing, you better dial 911. <laughs> but anyway, then they said, get down on your knees, and while you're groveling around for your bedroom slippers, remind yourself you're an alcoholic, and the problem is you. And ask to make lemonade out of the lemons of life that are bounced your way today, and get up and get on with this. And I did it because I wanted to be sober more than I wanted to be drunk. And I don't know when it was, but I found out who I was talking to in a calm God. And I love my God as I understand him. He's just everywhere. I see God in the eyes of the new people. I see God in the eyes of, of the people in AA, of the people in al that I know that I've come to love. I see God in the eyes of 
of all my 12 grandchildren and of my three great-grandchildren. What a blessing. And I see God playing in the lives of all of these people. I, I see God in charge when the family gets together because they're intact today. I, I hear it on a telephone. My, my, one of my grandsons, Adam, Adam, who now has three years of sobriety, I remember Adam calling me, and he said, Grammy, this is Adam. And I said, hi, Adam, what's up? He said, Grammy, he said, you know, you saw us all 10 minutes after we were born. And I did. I was invited to the hospital with every single grandchild I have to see it because I was needed. I was wanted to share in one of the biggest blessings that my children had because I'm sober. And Adam said, I wanted to call you up, Grammy, and let you listen to this. And I heard those little lamb sounds that a new baby makes. And he said, Grandma, this is Madison, your first great-grandchild, and she's 10 minutes old. Now, you know, this, these are the blessings that you get. These are the, like, the following. When, when I was speaking out in California for Susie, and, and we were a mile high up in the mountain, I had a granddaughter who cared to drive from San Diego all the way up there to surprise me just to say, hi, Grandma, and boy, we well and it's good to her. I'll tell you that. She's never forgotten that. Always said to love, Susie. And, and just, it's things, things like this that are so wonderful. It, it's a teacher calling from a grade school and saying, Mrs. Gordon, I don't know how you're going to take this. This is when my kids were younger. She said, you know, the assignment was that everybody in my class was to bring in the book that's read the most in the home. <laughs> she said, John. John came and I said, what is, the, what is your book? And he stood up and she said, he said, Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and held it up. And, you know, it, it's stuff like that. Anyway, I didn't know how to let go and let God. I don't know. You say it all the time. Let go, let go, let go, let go. I didn't know how to let go and let God. And um, somebody said, anybody ever fix anything for you in your life? And I said, yes. My grandfather. And they said, give us an instance. And um, I remember... I had a raggedy doll I loved, and I, I used to have tea with my raggedy underneath a cherry tree and just loved it. And uh, the dog came along and grabbed her and tore everything out from her and uh, tore up her arms, tore up her... She was in a miserable condition and picked the doll up, <coughs> took it to my grandfather with all the parts and climbed up on his lap and said, Grandpa, can you fix this? And I remember those strong arms, and I remember those eyes looking into mine. He, he said, I can't not fix you, Beth, until you let go. And I released the dial. No questions, no telling him how to fix it. Just released her with all that love and respect and belief of a child, that blind faith of a child. And that's how I have to let go and let God today. Incidentally, Raggedy sitting in my old high chair in my dining room. <laughs> Still with all those great black stitches he put in there. Um, this helped me terribly when I did my first, fourth, and fifth step and had to come to grips with the fact that uh, I am responsible because of my irresponsibility when I was drinking for the death of two of my children. A little girl that was a year and a half that had the measles that I did not watch I was drunk all the time, and uh, my daughter tried to tell me she was having convulsions. My daughter tried to tell me 
that she was turning blue. Annie did, and I didn't believe Ann and I, because I was too busy drinking, and Annie ran next door and got the neighbors, and they came over and helped him in. But the neurosurgeons from Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital said Kimberly had suffered for very violent convulsions, and uh, she brain she lost a lot of oxygen to the brain, and she retrogressed back to being a three-week-old baby, and she remained that way till she died when she was nine. We had to put her in a private home. Uh, my husband made it possible to go down there twice a week on his travels. My um, he took the children down there as they came along to. So they'd know their sister. I never went down there. I never saw Kimberly sober. Never. And on the Good Friday when she died, and my husband went down to get her with the funeral director and and brought her back, and, and he sat with her, and he and the children took charge. And, and um, I stayed locked up in my room with a bottle. That was tough stuff when I got sober. I also had a little boy that lived eight days, and he died in 1970. He died of alcohol poisoning uh, because his mother drank around the clock while she was carrying him, always knowing everything was going to be all right with well, Leslie. Uh, you know what you said to me about forgiveness, and I thank God for you. You said to me, you know, Beth, God knows everything that has gone on in your life, everything from the day you were born. And yet God, fully being aware of this, forgave you enough to hand you a gift of sobriety. And if God has forgiven you this much, who are you not to forgive yourself? And that's where it began. And it took weeks, it took months, it took years to come to the grip, to come to grips with the fact that without alcohol in my life, I am the greatest mother, wife, grandmother, great grandmother that ever walked the face of the earth with alcohol and nothing, nothing. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and finish the steps the first time around and continue to work on them one, two, three every day, ten every day. I, I just, um, I believe that, um, you know, amends are how I live my life today trying to be kind, as kind as I can, with all my mistakes and failure. I've got a lot of mistakes, you know, that I make. And that's why I have a sponsor, to keep me in an upright position. That's why I have a home group. That's why I continue to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I watch those children, and I go over to those homes, and I see what they have done in their families, and I thank God for the man I was married, and I thank God that you have shown me how to live sober so that I have a chance to share in the lost tooth from the first time, to have my grandchildren over, to know there is no fear connected. And it took a long time. It just didn't happen overnight. My son Bruce didn't talk to me for three years. And what you said to me is, you know, you continue to go to his games. You continue to sit there. And, and you don't hold it like you'd squeeze a butterfly. Let it fly away. If it comes back, goody. If it doesn't, we'll help you deal with it because it wasn't meant to be. There's nothing like sobriety. And that wonderful man who hung in there all those years, um, we got to know each other again. We went walking in the sunshine. We held hands. We um, learned what each other were all about, and I learned what love was all about. <laughs> and, and I thank God for you for that. And I thank God for Bruce in his unconditional love. Um, when I was... Four years sober, Bruce got leukemia, 
and uh, I watched a wonderful man go downhill for two years, and there was nothing I could do about it. Totally powerless. And you were there. You, there wasn't a day that went on that you didn't have a card in the box, that, that you didn't come over to visit. You took my children and taught them how to skate. You took them swimming. You took them to the movies. You did all those things with them, and I thank God for you. When I couldn't get out, you came in with your big books and your 12 and 12s. When I needed to go someplace, you came over and babysit, sat. How wonderful. Bruce loved you, absolutely loved you. And, and the night before he died, he said to me, you want to dance? Now, I had watched this man. Teach me how to live again, along with you. And he taught me how to die. He um, never put his needs before any of ours. He never complained. We put an old, on an old Sinatra record, and I held him close and not. Uh, he said, Bethy, I want, I want to tell you something I never want you to forget, and I want you to pass it on that not only did AA save your life, but it saved our lives too. And pretty soon I will be able to say thank you to the man who made it all possible. Letting go of him was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life, but we all did it together. The children and I, and we tucked him in, and we kissed him goodnight, and we walked out of the room. It, um, you know, and I didn't have to drink. I, I thank God for AA, for showing me and my family through 12 steps how to get through, yeah, those dark times, how to see a ray of sunshine coming through the clouds. And if you're new, all I can say to you is stay here. Don't even keep coming back. You give yourself the edge. Just stay here. And no matter how tough it gets, we'll help you sail through it. And you'll be able to see a ray of sunshine coming through the clouds. It's a wonderful way of life. Wonderful. It teaches you how to laugh. It teaches you how to cry. It teaches you how to feel all over again. Nothing like it in the world. I want to share one more thing with you real quick. And ha ha, I didn't start until 25 after, and I'm going to finish one hour. <laughs> so, we'll see how you do tonight. 9 years ago uh, I had uh, I had surgery. I had to have the carotid artery uh, bypassed in the heart. And um, it, after five and a half hours it it all went well. You know, they cut you up like a turkey for Thanksgiving and all that kind of jazz and and it went pretty well and the kids hung in there through you know, in 3 hours I what was in ICU and and they left and uh, as I understand it, all hell broke loose. Um, evidently, I hemorrhaged from the breastbone and lost four and a half quarts of blood, which is a probably about all I've got anyway. And um, they got me up to surgery in time. Um, no blood pressure, no heartbeat. Um, Till the needle went in the chest, and then after seven and a half more hours of surgery, here it is again. Uh, during that time, a short time, um, when nothing was working, when no blood pressure, the heart was in. The doctor said, "You know, we were we were ready to say you're gone." I don't know. I went somewhere. I didn't see a white light. 
but I found myself someplace I have never seen flowers so beautiful in my life. I have never seen sky so blue and clouds so white. And across there was a lake and it was almost crystal clear. And across the lake was coming a boat. And there was a man rowing the boat, and there were two children in this boat. And I got to shore, and the man and the two children got out, and I knew who they were. And when they got close, and, and the man put his arms around me, and he said, you can't stay. He said, your job isn't done. But he said, when your job is done, we'll be waiting for you. I felt the children. I felt so much love, so much. It's hard to explain. So I know something. I know forgiveness is there. I have never felt so forgiven, so loved so full of serenity in my life. And I know something from that, that there's hope for everybody. And no matter how far down we have gone together, when we don't drink, we go to meetings, and above and beyond all, one drunk carry one drug helps another drug. All the peace, joy, happiness, and forgiveness is there for us. It's a wonderful way of life. And I thank God for every second that I have here. And now may the road rise to meet you and the wind be always at your back and the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain falls soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand in the nows of each day. Thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>